I know that we all grieve in different ways, and that's okay. Um, if you need to express tears, that's okay too. And so it's great that you are here to be able to uh, talk about your journey. And to help us walk through that journey, I want to introduce to you Pastor Mike Ramsdale. Mike is, was the senior pastor here at our church. He's a Methodist minister, and he just recently retired. Shucks. <laughs> but good for him. Rhonda he, made me, so yeah, right. my wife is back uh, there. Yeah. So. He, he doesn't look nearly as tired, though. I know. <laughs> I, know. Uh, I told Rhonda yesterday, you know, I never have to set an alarm. <laughs> and we set an alarm for this morning. It seemed weird to set the alarm. <laughs> Which we tell Alexa, Alexa, wake me up at so-and-so time. That's our alarm now. If you want to meet Alexa, she's easy to find. I don't know how to set her. Use music. Yeah, right. That's right. Well, he and Rhonda have been doing some traveling, and so we're really glad to have Pastor Mike with us today. So I'm going to have you take it away. Good to be here. So, and, and, and again, I'll reiterate, this is really kind of an informal time. So just relax. No rules. Not going to push anybody. We're just going to kind of, if I can say the word, enjoy being together for a while. Uh, heading into the holiday season, which we're at now, Halloween, of course. And uh, for us, it kind of begins then uh, because that's the fall. And sometimes decorations sometimes come out, uh, maybe fall decorations. Ron, we need to work on that one. She's a little late on that one. So. <laughs> and not her fault. I bring them down from the attic, so that would be my fault. Uh, and then we have, uh, of course, uh, Thanksgiving season coming. We have Christmas season coming and all that goes with that. So we thought a great time to kind of get together and talk about that a little bit as we process life together, sharing life together. Uh, and I'm going to pray and talk about a few things. There will be some group times. Uh, you don't have to say anything you don't want to, but they'll, they'll, you'll probably be able to do it pretty easily. Uh, and there'll be two of those. No, they're going to come at your little table. And then we'll move forward to a final conclusion where we are now and see what happens next. So uh, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, our gathering this morning, the, the snacks that we had, those who set the tables up for us, those who unlocked the doors, and, and also, God, that we were able to get here today. We pray, Father, by your rich grace, it means so much to us, to uh, help us, help this be a, a good time for us, <clears throat> laying may, maybe a foundation for some days ahead that might, we might discover some goodness in them. Even in a season of grief, God, we know there's always hope. And so hope has us now sitting at tables, prepared to talk about what grief might look like through the holidays. And that prayer is in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, there's a Bible verse that says that there's faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. You know, again, faith, hope, and love. I'm going to tell you right now to begin that in seasons of grief, whatever level that is, whoever that is, uh, however long it's been, those are all the same thing in a way. Uh, and if, if there's a time we can say, so what does faith, hope, and love as a Christian look like? You can say, it looks like grief. Let me phrase that again. You want to really understand what faith, hope, and love, those great Bible words, really look like, then we can say, it's a grief. Uh, it may feel bad or painful, doesn't mean that it's not good. And because we feel sometime uh, pain or hurt or loss in seasons of grief, we think this is terrible, this is bad. Well, it feels that way. It may feel bad. But again, it's about faith. It's about hope. It's about love. You know, where do we get hold of this faith, which is the Christian idea? Well, well heaven is real, but it's not any more real than grief is. They're connected. It's about hope. Can I get through this? Can life, you know, become, pot? Can, can I make this work? Can I, can I hope that life is everlasting? And of course, it's, it's always about love. I mean, about love, because there's no grief without love. We love somebody. And we're not who we were before they died. 
and we lost something important to us. And we experience a mystery that we don't understand how to walk through. But it's because we love someone. And so grief and love is the same word. It's the same word. I loved someone. And what I want you to do now is simply kind of begin a journey with this couple hours we're together uh, by giving you an opportunity to talk at your table. And I want to give you some instructions. You have a little notebook if you want to write those down. Uh, but this is what we want you to do first, and I'm going to watch how long it takes. I want everybody at the table, if you, feel, if you feel like you don't want to, you don't have to, but I hope you will. Just tell everybody why you're here. What got you here this morning? Did somebody bug you? Uh, did you get a special invitation? Did you think, oh, it's the coffee and the cheese nips? You know, uh, or I'm just lonely. I want to talk to somebody today because I live by myself now and it's not easy to do. What is it? Is it, well, my husband died, my wife died, uh, and, I, and I'm dreading the holiday. Maybe that's it. Uh, maybe you want to say, and hope you do, well, here's who I lost. And these are the people that I've lost, if that's where you are today. Just tell them who it is. We're all dealing with the same story here common experience of faith, hope, and love defined by one word, grief, that we are feeling, and that what our next steps are. So just, just let people know why you're here, who it was, what it's about, maybe the relationship you had. Uh, well, we're going to talk more about that later, so I don't have to go too much depth and why you're here this morning. Uh, and so I'm just going to release uh, each group to do that. Uh, there's someone at the table who kind of can help guide you if that's needed, so know that you've got that person there. Uh, they may or may not tell you who they are, but uh, we, all, we all know. I see the age out here. We all have dealt with grief at the age we are. Yeah. We're all at the age, whoop, yep, I've dealt with grief or I'm dealing with grief. That just because with age, we know that. So, uh, so I'm going to turn you loose. Tell everybody why you're here. There it is. Okay, well, here we are. Uh, does anybody get, get this? I mean, we, we walk into the grocery store and think, does anybody know and care that, that I'm grieving or this person is, is gone or I lost this person in death? The, the world seems like it's falling apart for us. Does anybody understand? We might even say, does God care? Does God get this? Why did God do this or not stop it from happening or how does faith apply or heaven's a nice idea but I'm still here by myself. Rhonda and I left. I left more than she does saying if one of us died she wouldn't be able to reach stuff and I wouldn't be able to find stuff. <laughs> you know, uh, if, you, if, if you don't know her, if she stood up, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but there'd be other things too. You know, I, I haven't had a death of a spouse both my parents are gone, and I think about them every day. My mom's been gone 12, 13 years, 14 years. Uh, my dad, about 10. But I still think about them. We have, I have things in the house that came from them sitting here. There it is. That, and I think about them still. But now it's just kind of nice thoughts. I had good parents. I'm able to enjoy that. Uh, but there's still a grieving part of that loss. Uh, because not only do we lose that person, we lose part of ourselves. We lose who we are. None of us are defined totally independent, isolated or alone. We're all defined by our relationships as well as by who we are. When someone's gone, I lost part of me. How am I going to do this without part of me. You know, it's like something's amputated. How do I walk? It really feels that way sometimes. Now, to name that helped to understand. That's why the, the pain or the loss or confusion goes on longer than we might anticipate, because we lost part of ourselves. Who am I now? Who am I going to be? Can I be anything? Can I function in a new way? 
Is it possible? Faith, hope, and love says it is. So we're going to talk a little bit, or I am, uh, about, about Jesus. As I began saying in this last conversation, does God get this? And, and we wonder, and, and so it makes us even feel sometimes more isolated or more alone or more lost or more in a strange place. Uh, the Bible says Jesus is the Son of God. He's perfect and sinless. And, but he also gives us permission to be human, honest, vulnerable, and sometimes broken. And here's how I know that. Uh, Jesus, when he, when he came to go to the cross, you know, he's crucified there. Uh, when he made that decision to be obedient to God and go that direction, you know, he began with, God, if you could take this cup from me, I don't want to do it. Now, this is the perfect sinless son of God who is human on the earth with us. He says, I don't want to do this to God who sent him to do just exactly what he was going to do. I still don't want to do it. I'm not there. Because he knew what was coming. Jesus says that to God. But then he says, not my will with thine be done. I give it to you. And, and he releases that because he does that for us. Because you and I have no choice but to say, I can't control this death. I couldn't stop it. We're not enough doctors, not enough energy, not enough. I couldn't stop it. It happened anyway. And so Jesus says with us, it's in God's hand somehow. I'm going to let that go as he does and then go to a cross. It's hung there. You know the story. And there are the famous seven last sentences or word that he said while he's on the cross. Now, to see that Jesus understands what I'm going through, identifies with us, is with us. We're not isolated, uh, understands every pain and hurt we have even we say, God, I'm so mad at you, or God, I'm, I'm loving you today, or God, I feel good about my relationship today, go away. You weren't there when I needed you. Here's what happens in his story. First, Jesus was rejected by everybody pretty much. Betrayed, I know that story. He was denied, that's Peter and Judah's story. Uh, he was abandoned by his closest friends and followers, he was questioned, misunderstood, and crucified after a, a fake false trial and accusations and scourging. He knows what suffering and loss feels like. Again, I'll say it again, what it feels like. And when you talk about grief, you're talking about a feeling. I feel this way. When the Bible says we're created in God's own image, it's about our feelings. We feel the ways that God feels. He understands what those feelings are. Not we don't have the power that God has, but we have the feelings that God has. We know how to love. We understand how to forgive. We know how to cry. These are all things that happen in the story of Jesus going to the cross. And the last words that he says, the things that he says, he says, Father, forgive them and know not what they do. We get, we get a, a sense in this whole season what forgiveness feels like. Even maybe forgiving the person we lost, where we have pain from. Or letting God forgive us when we're in some place we wish we weren't. Mess up or make a mistake or act in a way we would not have acted before the loss or the grief. Uh, there's this consumption of forgiveness that overshadows all of it. And he shows us something about that in his own willingness there to simply surround everything in the cross with this grace and more grace, the nature of a loving God who gives us comprehensive forgiveness. So we have this God who understands this whole nature of, of death and life and, and sin and mistakes and hurt and pain and, and love and hope and all that, you know. It's all part of it. And it's okay. And it teaches us that in what Jesus did these last words. He looks at a man next to him and says, as he's experiencing suffering himself, there's a man next to him on a cross too. He says to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. He redirects 
from this place of pain and hurt. I can't imagine what being on a cross might feel like. Following rejection, abandonment, betrayal, denial, and isolation, all that the world did to him. But he stops and is able to see something beyond that. And the next, you know, today you'll be with me in paradise. We're learning about the God who is with us in whatever circumstances we are in, whatever loss we've had, or however we even feel about it. The questions or uh, the accusations or simply acceptance, wherever we happen to be, or whatever stage we're in, just today, or what's coming, or, or, or a month, or a year, or, or 10 years past the death, and the times we're surprised, like, I thought I was past this, and I feel like it was just a day ago now. Where did that come from? I got hijacked. I got surprised. Well, Jesus teaches us that when he says, today, today you'll be with me in paradise. Again, the seven last words. Then in that same context, he's on the cross, he's dying for the sins of the world. What a great, magnificent journey uh, God did in sending Christ to our world. But he also stops there as he's hanging on a cross. I don't want to describe what it's like to die on a cross, but it's pretty tragic and pretty difficult. Um, but he, his mother's out there, and one disciple's there whose name is John. And he says to his mother, Behold your son, talking about John. John, behold your mother. His care for those he's leaving behind. He feels that care. And he knows his mother in that society would be left isolated and alone, probably in poverty. There was no, there was no group to take care of people. It would be very, very almost impossible to survive without someone to give her care. And he says, John, you're going to do that for me. And we see his own sense of bringing to us permission uh, to care about people around us. Like, Help here, give, give there. This is the one who says, I'll be with you to the end of the world. We have that picture. Uh, we have what, to me, is one of the most important things he said on the cross. Sometimes we think it's God forgive them, they, not, they don't know what they do. But this is where I go to often. He says on the cross, now he's the son of God, he's got this better than you and I do, and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those words have given me permission again and again and again to be in a place where I just simply don't understand, where I feel Others feel lost or isolated or broken. Where some might say, God's not been very good lately because of. And if anything, anything ever says that, grief does. Now we can say, well, they're in heaven, and I believe that. I mean, heaven's a huge part of our faith, hope, and love journey. But it doesn't mean that I won't question, but I'm stuck here without this person are these people. I'm feeling this loss and this hurt. My life is broken and not what it was. I've lost myself along with that person or those people. We find ourselves there. And, and, and Jesus found himself there on the cross, suffering, rejected, isolated, broken, denied, betrayed, and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's an Old Testament verse, by the way, he's quoting. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I don't think God said, oh, I'm done with you now, Jesus. <laughs> you said the wrong thing. You told me how you felt. You said something about the pain you're in. You questioned why this was necessary. All the things that went with that question. Because he didn't know everything at this point. That was still to come. But we, it's okay. It's okay. To, to this man, God, we spent life this together all these years, and now I'm alone it's just not fair. You know why we might say that? Because it's not fair. <coughs> why might we say that? Because grief is a real experience of feeling that's overwhelming within us, manifests in all kinds of ways, and it's simply okay to experience that. Because Jesus did in this verses, as he says that to you and me, and that's the one who's with us. That's why I say often at funerals, and I've got two funerals coming next week, 
I got a call yesterday about two of them. It, it happened at once for me sometime, but you know, I'll say, today the cross makes sense. Sometimes we think it doesn't. What's this cross business about? Well, if you're experiencing the pain of a cross in your own loss, you say, I get it now. That's why God sent his son to be crucified, not just uh, to die for me, but to experience what I would experience one day here in this journey in my own life. My, in a, a moment of pain, rejection, fully human, wondering where God is and why he, I am here, sense of honesty and directness with God, where he's, he's equally aware of his faith in God, yet consumed by the pain, death, and rejection he's experiencing. You know, and, and I like to think that when, when I read all that about him, I, when I say, Jesus, sometimes that's all I've got to say. Because some days that's all I've got. Some days that's all you've got to say. Some days that's all you've got. You have to work it all out, figure it all out, make it all pass some logical pattern of how I walk through the process. We'll talk about that later this, this morning, but sometimes that's all there is. Sometimes that's all I've got. Sometimes that's all you've got. You know, uh, in, in this loss. Uh, another word that he said, which I think is equally important, he said, I thirst. So he's got, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he says, I'm thirsty. What do we do often after a funeral service? We make you eat. And if you don't, somebody's going to work you till you do. And you want to say, well, you shut up. I'm not hungry. But I thirst. The, 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 the reality of being human and the reality of who we are, even the pains of the, I forgot that about them. I'm having a hard time, if it's been a long time, I've got to think to see their face, you know, as we are human beings. And we feel guilt about, wait a minute, I shouldn't be having fun today. That, that's showing unfaithfulness to the person I lost, you know. But we're human. We have human needs and concerns and hurts and all that kind of stuff. And so it's okay to say, hey, I need, I'm thirsty. I've got to go to the movies or do something. I can't stay home all the time. Uh, I might even, for a person who's dealing with grief, lost a, a loved one, lost a spouse, might say, I've got to eat with someone other than the one I always have eaten with. You know, that's the dating process. I, that's an unfortunate word. I don't like the word dating, whatever that means. But it's saying that I'm human. That's part of who we are. And, and so it releases us to understand the, the nature of Jesus Christ crucified, how we journey our own life to who we, what we put together in the place of what we used to have. That's the reality of being human. I'm sorry, I know I sound like I'm preaching, but... I want everybody to be able to hear me, and so I've got to talk louder than I would normally do uh, in a group, and I want to make sure that uh, Carly hears everything I'm saying. So, <laughs> Rhonda, too. No, Rhonda doesn't have to listen to me. So, <laughs> she does sometimes. So, I thirst. Uh, he says, "It is finished. It's finished. This is this is where I am now. I'm I'm finished with this part." of where I am, but something new is going to begin. Something new is coming, uh, you know, and that's all that Jesus does in life, everlasting life, and all that he does in our life. So it is finished, but uh, I've done what I came to do, and somehow this is okay, and only God knows what's going to be next, because we don't. If anyone is surprised if someone who loses a close loved one Surprised about the what's next, that they're, I never thought this. I never expected this. I never saw this. I, I didn't even wonder about this, yet this is where I am tonight, or this morning, or this week, or this year, or this Christmas, or this Thanksgiving, or this holiday, you know, and how we process our life together. And, and, and we know holidays are all about relationships. So make them the holidays. So you lose someone, it's not, Thanksgiving is not the same. It can't be. Even if you have the cornbread dressing, which is the only kind of dressing I think matters, is cornbread dressing myself. So there's this uh, bread stuffing that some people use, but I have no idea why. 
uh, my dad's from Massachusetts, my mom from, from uh, West Texas, and their first Thanksgiving, she made cornbread dressing. First, he didn't know what dressing was, <laughs> what stuffing, and cornbread, he never had cornbread. And she mixed it together and stuck it in a turkey. <laughs> he pulled it out of there and said, what is this? And she cried. <laughs> so throughout all their life, together, my life growing up, we always said, uh, this ridiculous oyster stuffing uh, that m my dad liked and cornbread dressing every time we, we had both. And I grew up, I'm going to pick the cornbread dressing over the oyster stuffing, but that's my own decision. Who, who else here does oyster stuffing? See, this is some of you. What did you do? Right. <laughs> Let's say, if there's not cornbread dressing on the table, just forget it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Got in New England to like it. I've, I've tried it, uh, but it's gummy, and it smells bad, and the color's not very good, you know. That's right. But back to what I was originally saying, uh, holiday is about relationships, and that's why they're so terrifically changed when someone we love dies. You know, it's not, it's, it's, we, ha we have great Thanksgiving today because we have grandkids. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same as it was when I put them in the car and took them to my parents' house. We don't do that anymore. I was unhappy when my mom and dad started ordering from Kroger's instead of cooking it themselves. <laughs> mom, what's the matter with you? I'm old. Okay. That's right, pretty much is what she said. But still, I wasn't happy with it. Uh, and the last words that he says on the cross, Father, into, those, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And I give this to you, Lord. I give my life, my soul, what's going to happen next to you? I just give it to you. And, and sometime all we have is, God, I'm going to give this to you because I can't do it. And he couldn't. It wasn't his job. His job was to go to the cross in obedience to God, uh, and God's job was to do the rest which is basically Christianity in a nutshell in our story. But I share that because I, I don't want people to feel like that you're alone in how you feel, what you experience, where you are, what you're going through, what you might go through, or that God doesn't understand, or God doesn't get it, or God's above and beyond all this mundane, earthly, grief stuff. He's not. There's a reason. There's a reason the cross and the cross makes sense in a season of loss and grief. You can apply that, too, to your own journey. So stepping aside a little bit to, uh, I found I had cancer, or, or again, a grief, or another loss. Those things also apply in your own story in life, where we uh, take our helplessness to a God who understands where we are in our life. So I want to share those things because, for me personally, those are a critical part of dealing with the grief I've experienced. And I've only lost my parents, not I've only lost my parents, but not lost a spouse or a child. Thank you, Lord, for that. But uh, I know those are also apply in the same way, in an important way. Okay, now I want to move to a next step in a group session. Uh, I think you all weren't through talking anyway, but this is a second piece of this. Uh, this group is really about grieving through the holidays, the uniqueness of it. And if your first season of going through the holidays you're probably going to, you may think, I'm going to be able to do this fine, and you're going to get there and find out you can't. Uh, you'll be surprised, maybe hijacked a little bit by things you weren't expecting, but it depends on a lot of different factors in regard to it. But we're talking about that. So what I want you to do now in the group, you might need to write these things down. I want you all to talk about holiday traditions, especially that included this person or these per people, if you've lost more than one person. And so, what are the holiday traditions this person was part of? My dad carved the turkey. And he did, and he beat you to death if you tried to take it from him. That's his job. Uh, and somewhere after, my brother and I, I have an tw identical twin brother, uh, I have two sisters, we would go there for Thanksgiving. And we, my brother and I got together one year and said, this year we're going to make our dad do the prayer. Because he never did that. Uh, one of us, well, we're preachers, we always got the job. Steve, your turn. Mike, your turn. We're going to make him do it this year. So we made a plan 
that when it came time, dad's doing the prayer. And he did it forever after that. And so that was part of those holidays. So what are those traditions that person was a part of? What are the elements of your holiday? Oh, we do this on Thanksgiving. We, we, then we go shopping on Good Friday and spend all our money. You know, uh, well, we decorate or we don't decorate. Or we go here, we go there. Or, or we don't do anything anymore. We just go to Las Vegas and gamble our money away. Whatever you do on the holidays. Nobody does that, do they? Okay. Uh, you, you do, you, whatever you are, this Christmas, Christmas Eve, we go to church at Christmas Eve, well, we never do that. We give our presents around, or whatever you do, and, and especially how that person participated in, in those elements. You can talk about foods. Here's the food we shared. In the Bible, food is a tremendous part. Well, you just finished a series here at the church about eating together, so food's a bigger deal than you think it is about the sharing of those meals and, uh, and what special drink or you know, or the, uh, for us at Thanksgiving, this uh, green beans and onions and stuff. We always have that. I don't even like it. Why do we have that on the table? But it's part of our stuff, and Rhonda makes green beans, and you like it, right? Everybody else likes it. Okay, okay. <laughs> now you know us. <laughs> There's cornbread dressing on the table with gravy. Why would you option the green beans when you got this? So anyway, that's we'll just. Oh, are you gonna do that? So, I like fried oysters. Uh, but so, what are the foods? What are the locations? Where are the? If it's multiple, fine. If it's one place, fine. Location. And what are the positive memories? that you have from these things, or the posits. And if you have any negative memories, that's fine. Well, really, we hated Thanksgiving because Uncle so-and-so always came and nobody could stand him. I mean, <laughs> that's just a joke nobody has experienced. But what are the negative memories? What are they for you? Uh, now, you don't have to, don't include grief in that. That's still to come. Because obviously, for many of us, a holiday without someone we love that's, that becomes a negative experience sometime for you, you and I. So. so does that make sense? Share those things uh, now if you would. Um, <laughs> let's process a little bit. Uh, and I may ask the ministers to help a little bit or anybody else too. Uh, in a moment, if you are willing to do that or, or want to do that or can do that, that includes everyone here, I'll, I'll ask you, is there things that you do now that help you? I'll give you one simple illustration. Some people light a candle, you know, in honor of that memory of that person. They put it out. Uh, that's not telling you to do that, but that's illustrating there are things you can do. So, and so we'll, we'll talk about that in a while. Um, but in, in, in this season, embrace grief as normal and even good. And that's rephrasing how you understand your experience where it doesn't feel good. And feelings are important to us, and we don't like bad feelings. We don't want to cry. Uh, but if we understand it, it's okay. Embrace that as normal and even a good part of loving someone. And losing someone it changes our experience of that moment, even if it's a surprise moment that pops up, or it's a whole month of I hate this month, whatever you think. It's just okay. Uh, crying is fine. It's okay. Jesus cried at a funeral of a friend. Jesus wept at the loss of Lazarus. So it's okay. Uh, and so we might talk to ourselves all kinds of ways, trying to talk ourselves out of it, or say, what's wrong with me? Or you don't have any faith. Or, you know, I don't like this. Just don't bother. There's no reason to do that. You know, uh, you don't have to do anything. And so embracing it, I picked that, put, these are things that I've thought of and also read about and a variety of sources. But again, embracing grief sometimes helps to understand it more fully and seeing it as good instead of bad is also helps to understand it more fully. Uh, so again, I'm happy to grieve sometime, and I do. 
and I'm happy to do that. So, um, secondly, own own your feelings; they're yours. Just own them. Grief, loss, pain. Just own them. It's all right to say this is mine, but don't let them own you. We still choose how we behave. I may cry, I'm not going to jump off a building. You know, so you own them, even though you also uh, make sure you don't let them own you. And that's an intentional, conscious thinking, going to grief workshops or uh, praying, uh, going to church, whatever you do to make sure that you have control of those feelings at a level where you're able to behave in a proper way. So behavior is still our own, our choice. We choose how we behave, you know, but we may not choose how we feel. And hear me, please, we learn how to do that. In fact, that is what uh, maturing as a young person is, as a child is. They mature and are able to experience their feelings but behave in ways beyond the feelings. I'm mad. A five-year-old gets mad, and they're... And they stomp their feet and roll around on the floor. You know, they scream, you know. And as time goes on, we stop doing that. We still be mad, but there's other ways to behave to be being angry. So write that down. You have control of that, and you learn to do that as a pattern you developed. And so if grief, you behave badly the first month, you may keep behaving badly till you, that's your pattern now, and oh, I'm stuck. So don't do that. Think it through. Stop. Still grieve. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, thirdly, it's okay to talk about a loved one with other people. Well, they, you know, it's okay to talk about someone. And that's difficult because they have a tendency not to do that with you. Because they say, well, if I mention so-and-so, they're going to be upset and sad. And I don't, want, I don't want them upset and sad, and I don't want to be upset and sad either, so then we don't talk about it. Find the people you can talk about it with. Usually that's someone else who also is grieving, which is why you're here. And so people want to talk about it here. So don't, don't feel like, oh, I've got to act like so-and-so never lived because nobody <laughs> wants to talk about it. You know, it's okay. Name that person. Remember that person. Share that person. When I was with, we did so-and-so. Uh, I remember that story, and, and she or he or, you know, those, that's okay to do. And sometimes, somehow in our society, we don't like doing that, or we think it's inappropriate, or we just don't, or we, we think that, uh, well, it's been, t it's been six weeks. We should be fine by now. You know, because they're fine. <laughs> they're past it. So uh, uh, just own those feelings. Uh, it's okay to talk about people and remember them and have things that mark who they are. Uh, I had someone who had, her husband had this big easy chair in the house, and she liked it. But when he passed away, uh, it, it was still there, and it made her feel bad. Because uh, she thought about him. It was like a few days after. After the funeral, I said, go home and sit in that chair. She didn't want to sit in the chair. Go home and sit in the chair. Just sit there. Think about your husband, the life you shared. Uh, and that chair became a treasure for her. She wanted to get rid of it. There's other conversations about should you tell your, sell your house or not and that kind of thing. I'm not going to have those today. But uh, time helps us make better decisions. Time helps us make better decisions. Time helps us make better decisions. And we want to do things in a knee-jerk reaction because we feel bad at a given day. Take care of yourself. Have a structured, ordered plan of how you're going to do that. Do I have a gym membership? Well, I go three days a week, whatever you're going to do. Don't stop doing it or begin doing it. That's not my own right. There's other ways to exercise. But do something that gives you this challenge to take, it's okay 
to take care of yourself. If I take care of myself, it means I don't love them. I, I can't love them. I must not have loved them if I can take care of myself or I should do that or I should suffer and wither away and die myself. Again, it's not behaving properly, even though I might feel like doing it. So I have a very structured, I'm going to do this. Take care of yourself uh, in, in every way. Uh, you know, make sure you keep faith alive. Mm -hmm. Don't give that up. If you go to church, keep going, even though it's going to be really hard. Make your, behave, <laughs> just make yourself do it. Even if you don't want to. Uh, after a while, if you don't, you're creating a new pattern, and the pattern you created is going to be self-destructive as time goes on. You're sabotage, sabotaging your own recovery from dealing with grief. You don't really recover from grief, but uh, sabotaging your own ability to deal with that in a healthy way. And so keep doing that. Have a plan. Uh, food, uh, you know, exercise. And, and I always challenge people with this because it's remarkable how many older people lose someone they love, especially a spouse, and decide, I'm going to become an alcoholic now. They don't mean to do that. They don't intend to do that. But somehow people do. Research has shown that. that they, they may drink a glass of wine every day all their life, but all of a sudden it becomes five. Yeah. And they go, how did I get here? Behave. Think ahead of time. Be conscious of that hint to do that, you know. Uh, whatever it is might be in that case. You know, be selfish a little toward taking care of yourself. It's good to do. Again, Jesus said, I thirst. I, I thirst. So there's simply silly illustration, but I want to give that because it's a pattern that people often have. Uh, the stabilizing person is not there. Uh, this loss now is what drives my feelings. And because of that, now, I now behave this way and it may become a, an ongoing pattern that is destructive. When my dad lost my mother, he had deep, deep depression. And we thought, who is this guy? Uh, but he began seeing a counselor. It helped him get through that journey himself. My dad was not one. He's a retired military officer. Wasn't one that did counseling. So uh, I grew up in a military family, and I blame that for a lot of things. But... Uh, <laughs> My own military experience was minor compared to having a military family, for those who have had both experiences. Uh, but he, he got counseling and helped him. He joined the gym, did some things he hadn't been doing, and he, he got a little bicycle. There was a bicycle in the neighborhood to take care of himself, you know. In fact, we bought him, uh, when mother died, we bought him, after a few months of that Christmas, we bought him a Starbucks car. He liked coffee. Uh, and he bought him a Starbucks card with money on it, and said, Dad, right down the road, there's a Starbucks. They have a big space there. They have chairs and tables. You can read your newspaper. Uh, he never did the phone stuff like that and any of that. But he read the newspaper. Read the newspaper there. You'll be around people. You won't be stuck in your little house. He bought a little garden home. And after about six months, we said, Dad, how's that going? Oh, I'm not going. I said, why? He said, because Starbucks is too much. And I said, but we gave you a card that pays for all of it. You're throwing that money away. And he looked at me like, it still costs too much. <laughs> he just couldn't pay $5, even for my money or our money, for a cup of coffee. Your dad's a smart man. I know. We, <laughs> we paid for it. We just wanted to get him out of the house because he would just stay, he would stay in that house, you know, all the time. Our babysitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for these sharing times, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a lot of things now relatively quickly. Uh, I never know what's going to hit someone. You may think, oh, I got that one, but maybe something here is, this is really where I am or where, what I need. Uh, you know, uh, let people help you. Don't turn your back on people who want to help you if you don't want to be bothered. Let people help you, whatever that might be. You know, I'm going to come by your house, and we're going to go out for coffee. You know, say, okay, uh, even, if, even though you don't want to. 
uh, let's, whatever it might be, let's take a walk together. Right? Here's some food. Are they going to bring you food? Let them do it. Let them bring you food and say thank you. And, you know, if you don't want to eat it, share it with somebody else. But, you know, let, let them do that for you. First, you're giving them a gift because they want to be generous. Uh, they may have experienced grief themselves. They want it. Let them do it. As a minister, it took me a long time to get there where I thought, I'll let people do stuff for me. At first, I shouldn't do that. And they, and they want to. Okay. I'm giving them a gift saying, go ahead and do that for me, whatever it might be, or for me and Rhonda. Because people do that with pastors sometimes. They want to do stuff for you. So, I'll right, let them do it. And they got used to it. So, uh, that's a joke funny to me. Uh, but let people help you. Let them do it. You know, there's, okay, and you might even build a new relationship you didn't have before. It might be meaningful for you in the future as you process through grief and what life looks like now. You mentioned it already, help others. Find some way to get out of yourself a little bit. And helping others is almost the only way to do that. That takes you out of yourself into somebody else's need. Whether it's I'm hungry or I'm grieving, you know, or I don't have a place to sit because I, I don't know how to sit somewhere without my spouse. You know, and, and just let them help, you know, help others. Find a, find a program, a ministry, a community endeavor. There's a thousand ways to serve somehow. Be surprised how quickly that transforms what is a legitimate grief into a grief that's manageable by helping somebody else. Everybody needs something. Everybody needs stuff. I don't care who we are. We got stuff to help others. So. And you might have a particular cause. Okay, my loved one died of this. I volunteer for the Cancer Society, whatever it might be. Just grab hold of those things and... And that's almost, you know, sooner is better. You know, you got a, you got a month or two, but don't wait too long. And you get a pattern in place that's not usually a healthy pattern. So you got a couple weeks of, you know, I'm going to sit down and look out the window and hope butterfly flies by. But, you know, uh, then you have to do that. Help others. Uh, I'll add my own ad. Don't do anything dumb. In times of crisis, in times of crisis, there's no crisis bigger than losing someone that you love. In times of crisis, people do dumb things. And they say, I would never have done that. And for us, it was, for my dad, it was Louise. He started dating Louise. <laughs> we thought that was dumb. That's another conversation. <laughs> Yeah, that's a long story. So, uh, what do you think, Ron? Am I right about that statement? Yes. yes. <laughs> Don't do anything dumb. You know, uh, when I help people through divorces, I say, number one, don't do anything dumb. Because people will do dumb things after a divorce. What's the matter with you? Uh, don't do anything dumb. And just knowing it and, and phrasing it and Thinking about it that way helps you say, yeah, that's dumb. That's dumb. I'm not doing that. So keep faith in play. It's easy to abandon faith. And that may be just going to church, going to a Sunday school class, or reading my Bible in the morning. But don't throw that away. It's okay if you don't feel good about it, but still keep faith in play. That gives God a chance to give you, get you through to a healthier way of living in the loss you've experienced. So... You know, keep faith in play. Do that. If you've gone to church, just keep going. And great illustration. Sunday school class, great illustration. Keep doing that. Um, don't stop. Avoid isolation. Isolation is almost always damaging. It's almost always damaging. And it's okay to be isolated sometime. But long periods of time are not good. Even though, what do I do now? When I come home, it's just me or I lost my child and I don't want to be around anybody, isolation is just never good. Life is built around relationships, and you have to have them. They're critically important, and you have to work at it usually. And it's harder work when we're dealing with grief, but just avoid isolation. It almost never goes anywhere good in the long run. Um, I won't say what I was thinking of Always embrace people who care about you. If there are people who care about you, embrace that. Don't abandon that because it's different. 
It is different. And you've got a friend, and, and it's a couple, and you don't have the half of the couple you used to have. You know, I, I, guess, I, I guess I'm going to end that relationship. You don't have to. <laughs> you can still have it. It may be different, you know, but don't just end everything because it's all different. Because, of course, it's all different. But embrace people who care about you, whoever they are. Uh, we, we have a tendency to all of a sudden, oh, she won't answer the phone anymore when I call. Or then respond to my text because they didn't feel good that day or they don't want to talk about whatever it might be. Just, just don't do that if you can avoid, help it at all. Uh, if you need to, go to a counselor. Counselors are good. If you need to, go to a psychiatrist. Sometimes medication is necessary. That's okay to do. And I know I sent my, some of my family, not this one, <laughs> but I sent some of my family set up appointments with counselors and psychiatrists to help them through seasons of difficulty, one going through a divorce. And so that, that saved them when I couldn't, when we couldn't. It's okay. And if you don't know who that is, call the church, or your church you attend, they'll probably know the counselor to go to or the psychiatrist to go to or call a Stephen minister, and they can often be that person that you need just to have to, to talk to, to they've been trained to help you, they can serve you, make that connection with the Steve minister, and we have some here today. And I can't tell you how important that is. Just having that objective, incompetence person who's trained and cares about you because they're volunteers to help you walk through this season and say, well, Friday morning is when I meet with my Stephen minister. And I can just tell them how it's gone. How it's been, and they can hear, listen, pray for me. You know, those are those are resources. Do that. Amen. Yeah, it's part of our story. Uh, so those are real quickly uh, grief recovery book. If you read the entire books, there's some resources out here. You can pick one up. Read one. Go online. They almost all say the same thing. If you're wondering, <laughs> almost all grief stuff says the same stuff. There's because there's we have that in common. We all have the same feelings. It's not that big of a difference. Some more things as we think about grief of the holidays. Be intentional about holiday events. You might want to write that down. Manage your capabilities in the season. So be intentional about it and manage what you're capable of. There might be something, I just can't do that this first year. I just can't do it. It's okay. But be intentional about it. I wouldn't necessarily fly by the seat of my pants because your pants are covered with grief and you feel bad and you don't want to do anything maybe. Or you may want to do something dumb. <laughs> so don't do either. Uh, so manage that. Manage that. Think about it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to start thinking about this now. What I want to do and not want to do. What can I do? What can I not do? Uh, how do I want to make this work? Because it's going to be so different and manage that yourself, and so do that. Uh, plan your season carefully. You can do that. Plan it. New Year's Eve, you may not have thought about it at all. What do you normally do? What do you want to do? What do you not want to do? What's going to be... <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, we always wait till the apple drops in New York, because that's 11 o'clock here. So that's our thing. We didn't used to do that. So, uh, but but manage those things. Yes. Yeah. There there are groups out there, in most communities that deal with. You lost a spouse. You lost a, a sometime a wife or a husband or either either are those groups exist. They often do really good things with their relationships. There are those dealing with the loss of a child or a parent. Same thing. Those things are out there for you. Uh, there's a there'll be a, a again a. Uh, ongoing journey through grief uh, in the spring here for those who are here now and those who are not here that may feel the need to come, community as well as this church. So that's going to come down the road. Those are nice things. Rhonda, I know, did one when she lost her mother, and I know that really helped you a lot to process that way. Because uh, they, they listened to her in a way I couldn't. You know, I'm her husband, so it was a little different for she and I, but uh, those folks who said, and those are intentional decisions. I think I'm going to give this. If you don't like it, you can always say, okay, enough of that. Her jokes are terrible. I'm not going to listen to that anymore. 
that's just a joke. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, that's a, just give it a shot. Always cover your bases. Yes, that's right. Um, be honest with your family and friends about how you feel. It's okay. I'm just kind of depressed today. It's okay to tell someone that. <laughs> They're going to say, okay, I get that, because I know what depression feels like. Not that I'd be surprised. So be honest with that, and, and we're not. We, we, we just don't present ourselves that way. We have to uh, protect ourselves from being honest about ourselves. And that's not, certainly not biblical and not what Jesus did. He said, why are you forsaking me, God? So honor old traditions and be mindful of how they have changed and how you have changed. No tradition that you've experienced will be the same as it was. Just be aware, it has changed, and I have changed. And with that in mind, time tells the tale. Time tells the tale. I've told many folks this, that uh, in, when I played basketball, and I sprained my ankle all the time, I learned that when I sprained it really bad, I had six months to get better. He wasn't going to get better next week. In fact, one time I was preaching uh, on a Sunday and I had sprained both ankles because I sprained one and decided to go back too soon and I sprained the other. So I'm on crutches, but both try to walk with both sprained ankles. So uh, the only answer was I've got to give it time for it to heal. Time is a big part of healing. And I would say for, depending on the level of loss you've had, uh, you're looking at years, looking at years, you know, loss of child or a spouse, you're looking for years and trying to get past or get to a place where I'm functioning better than I thought, you know, it's just, just, just be patient, be patient, follow some of the rules, uh, have a bad day sometime. It's okay to have a bad day. Uh, and hopefully the next day will be better, uh, but give it time. And again, honor old traditions. It's all right to do that, uh, but be mindful they've changed and you have to. Create new traditions. It's fine to do that. You're not saying I didn't love this person because we've changed our tradition now. You know, uh, it's okay. Create new ones. This is what I do now. It's working for us. We do it this way. Instead of this, I do this. Instead of that, I do the other. You know, Rhonda be in trouble. She can't get stuff down, Christmas decorations down from the attic. So I don't know what she's going to do. I go first because she has to change the decorating tradition. <laughs> she, I, I think, have, you, have you been up in our attic? We've had a house now about four and a half years. Have you been up in the attic yet? Once? Yeah. Once? All the way or just up no, the... Just okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I go in the attic a lot because that's where all our Christmas stuff is. So I bring it. I brought it down last year. There's about ten boxes of stuff in the trees. I said we don't put all this up. We only put up some of this. Can we work it out where we just have the stuff that we put up down here? No. <laughs> bring it all down. I'll figure it out. So so I bring all the boxes down and all the boxes up and all of them down, all of them up. Uh, that's just a joke, kind of. <laughs> uh, do something for others again uh, reconnecting with something or beginning something new um, set realistic expectations and a phrase I really like sometime survival is success sometime that's a good day I survived especially right after losing someone I survived today. It's okay. I, I fed myself, brushed my teeth, you know, took out the trash. Good. Every day doesn't have to be. I had this great new adventure of changing the world. So survival can be success sometime. Uh, phrase something I've said already a different way. Don't let grief cause you to withdraw from living. Sometimes we feel guilty. I feel guilty. I had a good time today. I shouldn't have a good time. It's not honoring the person I loved. And the person you love is saying, have a good time. 
So don't, don't let grief cause you to withdraw from life. Uh, phrase of something else and get, get a different way. Uh, control the story of the holidays if you can. Don't, they, don't, they don't have to control you. What are you going to do on New Year's Eve? I'm not doing anything. I'm going to eat a bag of chips, and then I'm going to go to sleep. Or I'm going to go to this party I was invited to. I got friends there. I'm going to drag myself out there, and I'm going to do it. But I'll leave when I'm ready. So, or I fall asleep when I'm not ready. Hallmark Channel works great. Yeah, Rhonda loves Hallmark Channel. I found it. We have, we have it. I can find it. We got new stuff here, and you can't always find the things. They always end the same way. It's nice having everybody happy at the end, isn't it? I know, and they're always happy at the end. I still like Walker, Texas Ranger. The good, the good guys always win. In movies now, good guys don't seem to win, and you're not sure if they're good guys or not anyway. <laughs> You know, I've got to confess, I like watching Hallmark Channel sometimes. Some of the Christmas stories I like. I can't watch five in a row, but, you know. <laughs> Every once in a while, one of them, I thought, that is nice. That's just nice and sweet. And it's not the Cowboys or TCU, but hey. <laughs> somebody came by and brought me, uh, I went to TCU, but uh, somebody came by this week who lives across the street from us, and she's the assistant, she's the executive assistant for uh, for those who know TCU, Sonny Dykes, the coach there, and she bought me a TCU helmet uh, with, signed by him, and God is Big Enough written on the top that he'd written on there. So for those who are familiar with God is Big Enough, I got a helmet, uh, TCU, that says that. I did her wedding and know her real well. Though. Is it purple? The helmet, is it purple? Yeah. Uh -huh. okay, I was laughing because I think they're purple, right? Now, I know TCU is purple. I think the helmet's purple, too, yeah. They have, they have the lettering on the side that's purple, and I'm guessing the rest of it's kind of... I have to look at it, but I'm not sure it's purple-purple. It's more of a light, light, maybe lavender or something. But <laughs> <laughs> the lavender frogs. But I know the, lettering, I know the lettering on the side, TCU, is purple. So... Uh, give yourself permission to grieve. One woman told me that, you know, sometime I just go home, I get in the bed, and I cover my head with a blanket, and I just lay there. That's all I do. But I can't stay there forever, so I have to get up. But that's just what I do. Just, it's okay sometimes. <laughs> of course, you don't have to be grieving to experience that depression. Sometimes it's a pretty common occurrence. Just do that sometimes. So. Um, and... You know, decorate. Just go ahead and decorate. Doesn't have to be the same as it was, but go ahead. Make yourself put the fall decorations out, even if it's just a one wreath. Get a smaller tree if you're tired of doing the big one or you can't reach the top or wherever you are with the tree. So uh, go ahead and do that. I mean, uh, buy the poinsettia. You know, the, you always cook turkey, get a turkey. Just get a smaller one if that's where you are. Uh, but go ahead and do that, even though you may not feel like doing it. You're setting a pattern for the years to come in your life. And so what's it going to look like now? Maybe different. Maybe feel different. You know, and you have the control of that. I, I don't. Just a suggestion. Do that. Uh, and is there something you can do especially that does mark the love you have for that person? You know, it could be like wearing the ring. But w what might that be for you? So is that one particular decoration? Is that an ornament on the tree? I is that a candle? You know, I wouldn't say recommend this, but someone I know, Ron and I both know, she, she always set a place at the table. In her case, it was her son and daughter both died. She set a place at the table for them. And her husband had, had died too. He didn't get a place at the table. I don't know, I'm not sure all the reasons for that. Uh, 
<laughs> we didn't ask that question. Uh, but she, had the, she always had a place for her son and her daughter at the table. Her son died in war, and her uh, daughter died uh, when she was six or seven, I think, of some kind of disease. Anyway, she said, it just made her feel good that this is, this is my life. My life is not just me. It includes them. They are still part of who I am. And so I don't just say, okay, I've got to write that up, get the eraser and erase that. You know, she chose not to erase it. And we knew Leslie, she was probably in her mid-80s. She was set in those places for, since 1945. Wow. As her husband died, her, her son died in a troop carrier in the North, North Africa campaign, for those who know much about war. leslie has gone now, but she was our uh, babysitter for our kids when we were y- young marrieds in a small church we served a long time ago, 1978 to 82. Anyway, I, I remember that story for a long time about Leslie. And losing her own kids, she spent the rest of her life babysitting kids at church. She worked in the nursery all the rest of her life. Then took care of our kids. Anyway, go ahead and decorate. What are you going to have at Thanksgiving? Where are you going to go? Are you going to be by yourself, be with someone? Uh, do something in service for the church, maybe? Those are sometimes options people take. Um, are you going to change the decorative pattern and go big or small or go insane? Or what you're, what, uh, we have neighbors who go insane. Uh, with the decorations. I, I don't go insane, but I do like decorations. So I like Christmas and setting it up. Okay. Those are all kind of the, the things we wanted to talk about here. Um, I think I'll be repeating myself saying much more. Uh, so we'll go back to the, the final piece of this. And uh, where, what, remind, or a continuation of the things that you're doing that's working for you now might help other people. Then we'll give next steps. Uh, then we'll pray. Uh, and then we will uh, go uh, have lunch. What time is lunch going to be here? I do. Okay, then we'll have lunch. Do what you want. And when it comes time to pray, I'm going to ask you to pray at your table, each table. Whether the Steve minister does that for you or someone else does, just pray for each other at your own table, rather than me doing it as a group session, if you'll be ready for that when that time's come. So, other things you're doing or have done are going to do, you think. I thought, I think I'm going to do this now. I wasn't going to do anything, but I'm going to do this, or I'm going to work this out, or anything you want to share, it may help someone else. And you verbalizing it may help you. Uh, so, I'm going to have you all do a short prayer for each other. I'll do a quick prayer for, following that just for the meal. Uh, come out here and eat. And you can remain as long as you like. If you want to come back in here and eat together, go right ahead and visit all you want. Stay as long as you want. Uh, Ron and I be slipping out a little bit early. Uh, again, I think I said earlier, maybe our son-in-law has a special. He's going to get his E8 stripes for those in the military. So uh, that's hard to get for Army. And so we're happy that we're going to watch that online, that ceremony. that they have. It's Army, you know, take that into account. But <laughs> I, was in the Na- I was in the Navy. That's where that joke comes from. <laughs> I know. One of, one of my great stories with him, when he, his... Uh, first son was three, I had him, I drove him places all the time, and I taught him to sing Anchors Away. <laughs> and, and so he called me, did you teach Cody to sing Anchors Away? I said, yes. He's singing it all the time, and he won't shut up. <laughs> I had great joy in that. So. I'll, let y'all pray, I'll let y'all pray for each other. Thank you, thank you God, for the food. Old friends, new friends, and the future God you designed for us to live through in grief and loss, but also in hope and faith and love. And that prayer is in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.